Good evening. I'm Eric Barker. I'm Dean of the Purdue College of Pharmacy, and it's my uh, pleasure to welcome you to this Ideas Festival event as part of the 150 years of Giant Leap celebration here at Purdue University. Tonight, we welcome Dr. Walter Korschitz, Director of the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. Dr. Korschitz joined NINDS in 2007 as Deputy Director and then was named Director of NINDS in 2015. A native of Brooklyn, New York, Dr. Korschitz graduated from Georgetown University and received his medical degree from the University of Chicago. Before joining NINDS, Dr. Korschitz held positions at the Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. A major focus of his research career was to develop measures, particularly brain imaging techniques for patients that reflect the underlying biology of their conditions. Guided by a variety of brain imaging tools, he pioneered acute clot removal for stroke patients with large artery occlusion, which is now a procedure practiced at comprehensive stroke centers across the country. Tonight, Dr. Korschitz will share some thoughts on the future of brain research with the Ideas Festival question, what if we could control the brain for better health? Following his remarks, I'll be back to begin a dialogue with him and then we'll have time at the end of the presentation to take questions from you, our audience. So with that, please join me in welcoming to Purdue, Dr. Walter Korschitz. Well, thanks, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me <coughs> to come to you today to talk to, at this Ideas Festival, because I'm going to talk to you about where ideas come from, between your ears. So again, as was mentioned, I'm one of the directors at the National Institutes of Health. I'm the director of the Neurologic Institute. But there are <coughs> uh, multiple other institutes, all with their own separate missions. And we try to cover the entire spectrum of health problems and advance the science behind each of these problems to develop solutions for patients. Um, the NIH is the world's largest research funding agency, and we are indebted to all of you who pay your taxes on April 15th every year for your generous donations. Um, but truth, truthfully, it is a testimony to the generosity and wisdom of the U.S. taxpayer to put this kind of investment into biomedical research. Um, now, I'm in the Neurologic Institute. I'm one of multiple other institutes that are involved in neuroscience funding. We'll talk about some of them. The point of this slide is that if one looks at the leading causes of disability in the United States, the brain disorders are the leading in those categories. If you combine the neuro, mental health, and substance abuse disorders as all disorders of the brain, they are the leading cause of disability in the US. And in fact, at NIH, they lead in the funding category. So there is more funding going into neuroscience than any other area of research from the NIH budget. Now, the challenges that we face in devising solutions for the neurological disorders, the mental health disorders, substance abuse disorders, are really quite striking in their complexity, the nuances, and the tragedies that they cause, which is what's illustrated in these pictures. In our society, uh, being able to pull a plow is not going to ensure success in life. Our con contributions to society depend heavily upon our, the ability of our brain to communicate, create ideas, devise contributions uh, to society in general, and is really at the basis of living a fulfilling uh, life. Many people don't have that opportunity because of, say, rare genetic disorders that they're born with. There's also conditions that concur out of the blue, traumatic brain injury, falling off your bike, um, stroke, sudden occlusion of an artery or bleed into the brain. Um, so there's acquired, there's, congen there's gen uh, genetic, and there are disorders we really don't understand their causes. Many of the psychiatric disorders would fall into that category. 
Um, so trying to devise solutions for these patients requires a knowledge of how the brain and the nervous system work. And although we have had some successes, we've had many more failures than we've had successes. And the failures are due to the fact that there are huge gaps of knowledge. We understand something, and we think we can go from that understanding to a treatment. We fail, and that's because there's a gigantic gap between what we know and what's needed to be known before those solutions are really going to take effect. I've used the analogy of trying to cross a river where you can see there's stones across the river, but from one side of the bank of the river, you can't tell how far apart those stones are, and you start jumping across them until you reach the point where you realize, I'm not going to make it to that next stone. And that's really the problem that we face uh, in trying to develop solutions for many of these problems. Now, our institute is one, as I said, of 27 institutes, and probably about 13 institutes are doing neuroscience. And so we're all a little bit different, so take that uh, what I say with a grain of salt in terms of generalizing across NIH. But in general, it's true that we invest in basic research, translational research, and clinical research. Translational research is the research that's needed to bring discoveries from the bench to the bedside. Clinical research is usually, I'd say, clinical trials. The basic research falls in two categories. And in our institute, 25% of the budget goes to basic neuroscience research that's disease agnostic. About 40 to 50% of the research goes to basic research on disease mechanisms. Um, so the major component in our institute is what we call basic research. Most of it is investigator-initiated research, so it's not top-down telling people what to do, but it's people have the ability in our system to submit a grant, have it reviewed by peer review, they get a score, we pay the best scores until we run out of money. And the system is not perfect. The review committees, it's a review by jury of your peers. Um, I always say that 30% of the time they get it completely wrong. Um, but if you look around the world, there is no better system that people have devised. Many of the other countries suffer heavily from grants that go to people who know somebody who's in position of power. Where in the United States, it's a much more American system on, based on this idea of meritocracy and jury by your peers, but in no means is it a perfect system at all. We are very interested in training because we know that many of the problems that are facing us are not going to be solved by the current generation, but the, as the tools develop, and we'll talk a lot about tools, the promise that future generations of scientists will solve these problems looks to us to be incredibly attractive. So I think it's a great time, particularly to enter neuroscience. And we'll be talking a lot about tools and resources, and that's something we think about. But particularly in neuroscience, the Brain Initiative is focused heavily on the development of neurotechnologies and therefore relies heavily on places like this who produce engineers, material scientists, computational uh, bioinformatics folks to, to work on problems of neuroscience. Um, so as I mentioned, we're one of multiple institutes that fund neuroscience, and the other ones are seen here. We're 100% neuroscience. Many of them are a percentage of neuroscience. Um, but again, uh, the budget ballooned to $8.12 billion of neuroscience research in uh, 2018. In our institute, as I mentioned, we fund across these three areas. Our translational program is somewhat unique and probably of, of interest to some of the people in the audience and at Purdue in the sense that we have been able to recruit people from industry who are very knowledgeable about the process of moving drugs or biologics or devices through the process of get FDA approval and then to go into patients. So we have what's kind of a, like a, a virtual pharmaceutical company but the purpose of that is not to actually make drugs or devices and market them as a company would, but instead our purpose is to build the case for a device or a biologic or a drug to the point where a drug company or a device company will say, it's not so risky as I thought and I'll pick that up. And so we are very interested in moving things to we able to hand them off to industry, so-called de-risking. And that's actually been very successful so far. 
It's important, we think, that we engage in this because many of the conditions that we deal with uh, are considered too risky by the industry. And, and many of the industry, especially the big companies, have moved out of CNS type research because of the high risk. So that's the purpose behind that program. But it's a special interest, particularly in a place like this, where there are so many innovative ideas that could come to the forefront and have the chance to move into uh, patients at some point. So that's kind of a general overview of the Institute and what we do, and I'd be happy to answer further questions about it. But I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about a very special project called the Brain Initiative. And the Brain Initiative is it's actually about the brain, but it's actually an acronym for Brain Research Through Advancing Innovative Neurotechnologies. So if you, that spells out brain. Um, and um, so that interesting title, but that was actually devised by the White House. Uh, and this program came from the Office of Scientific Affairs at the White House in uh, 2013. And it was the result of the White House group coming to NIH and talking to many different uh, folks around the country to try and understand what, what investment the country could make to advance neuroscience. And the answer was to focus on understanding circuits, and to do that and enable that by developing the neurotechnologies to see circuits, to manipulate circuits, um, and this is what the Brain Initiative is about. So I use the word, the three M's, when describing the Brain Initiative for people to remember it. First is for maps. You're trying to understand circuits, you need a circuit map. That involves the different cell types, how they're connected together, which is easier said than done because of the complexity of the spatial scales that are, are involved in the circuitry of the brain with 85 billion neurons and about a couple of trillion connections. So the mapping is probably without that comp comprehensive mapping of the human brain is probably not something within our grasp at least in, in my generation, potentially in the future generations. The next M is for monitoring. So we have made great progress in structural imaging of the brain, but we don't actually have the ability to see activity going through those circuits, and that's actually been a big problem, which we'll talk about. And the last M is for modulation, modulating circuits for health. So the three Ms I'd ask you to think about. So the Brain Initiative, is again has a singular focus on circuits, so it's, it's a portion of the neuroscience budget. It's not even close to uh, a major portion uh, of, the, of the neuroscience budget, it, but it's got this singular focus on understanding how brain circuits control how we move, plan, execute actions, remember, think, emote, and how to monitor and manipulate circuits for improved function. And when you think about people who have the disorders I described, whether they're mental health disorders, or neurological disorders, or substance abuse disorders, the patient's disability comes from not actually what's in the brain, but how it disturbs the circuits in the brain. In many neurological disorders, we're able to look inside the brain after someone dies, and we can see an area of abnormality, and we assume that that abnormality is affecting a circuit that's involved in, say, motoric function or cognitive function. But that's a supposition, and oftentimes it's wrong. Uh, but we had no way of testing it, because we had no way of interrogating those circuits to find out what is wrong with them. And the hope is that with the Brain Initiative, we'll be able to get at that, and that will become the diagnostic criteria for different brain disorders, as opposed to a symptom complex, which we think is related to some circuit abnormality, but we're basically guessing. Uh, we could be precise about what circuits are disordered would be incredibly important to help us to diagnose these disorders, particularly before they become uh, intractable to treatments. And then modulating the circuits. So if you think about someone who has manic depressive illness, Lithium, for some reason, I, no one really understands, is quite effective at preventing these kind of fluctuations into mania. 
it must be affecting a particular circuit. There's such a, it's such a unique characteristic switch that occurs in people with manic depressive illness. We don't know what that circuit abnormality is. The drug actually works for, but we have no idea how that happened. Think how better we could be in devising precise therapeutics if we could measure the circuit abnormality and then screen that circuit abnormality against drugs to actually improve the circuit function. Um, and there are examples where, although this sounds you know, like it's very far in the future, we have this example in Parkinson's disease where a deep brain stimulator put into a particular area of the brain that's been identified as a region that's important in the motoric abnormality of Parkinson's. When you turn on the stimulator, a patient can go from frozen and shaking to actually normal within a second. You turn off the stimulator, and seconds later, they're back in that terribly disabled state. So it's an attractive goal to be able to do that, not just for Parkinson's, uh, but for other disorders uh, in neurology and particularly in psychiatry. Now, the Brain Initiative luckily has considerable funding behind it. So uh, Congress has appropriated two types of funding, and the blue is funding that goes to the base of the institutes, and that funding generally is there on a almost permanent base, as permanent as anything else is in the government, which is not saying much, but it's, uh, it, does, it, we, it has been true in the past. And then the green is money that's been appropriated through the 21st Century Cures Act. But it brings the, the actual expected budget for the Brain Initiative um, to uh, $4.9 billion over 10 years. And we're at about the halfway point now. And um, so how do we basically go after this problem with the resources we have? And I use this quote from Freeman Dyson, who was a mathematician at Harvard and philosopher, who said that new directions in science are launched by new tools much more often than by new concepts. The effect of a concept-driven revolution is to explain old things in new ways. The effect of a tool-driven revolution is to discover new things that have yet to be explained. And that is where we really are in the Brain Initiative. There is so much that we don't understand because we haven't had the ability to monitor modulate circuits in the past. Uh, but with this new ability comes the chance to actually discover something new. And what the new thing is, in my mind, is the language of the brain. How does the brain process information? We know there are action potentials and that transmitters are released at the axon and they go over to the dendrite and they excite the next neuron or inhibit the next neuron. So we understand kind of the alphabet, but we have no idea what, how, how the alphabet fits together to be words or how the words fit together to be sentences or the sentences to be paragraphs or the paragraphs to be chapters or the book to be written. And that is the kind of fundamental in, uh, information processing fundamentals that are completely opaque to us now that with the ability to monitor circuits, we'll be able to get the data, and then really smart people, will, mathematically computational talented folks, may be able to, to kind of eke out what are these kind of grammatical rules in, which are being followed in, image, in information processing the brain. Now, I mentioned that structural imaging has improved considerably. When I came out of medical school in, in the mid-'70s, this was the first CT scan of a human uh, person, and we were very excited by seeing mush. There's really no information here except for we can see how big the ventricles are, which are that black fluid-filled area, but very little to understand that's going to help you understand the brain. But look what technology has done in 2019 with advanced high-field MRI. One can get almost histological images of the brain. And this has had a tremendous influence on how we practice neurology. Uh, my job, often as a training director, was to prevent the trainees from seeing the images until they saw the patient. Because once they saw the images, they felt they knew everything and didn't have to talk to the patient. That was wrong, but it, they could get by uh, because the imaging became so powerful. Um, now, what we haven't been able to do is to actually see the circuit connections, so the map of the brain. And how to do this is quite 
because of, the, of what I mentioned about the number of cells and the number of connections is, is really quite complicated. Uh, but there have been some new techniques that allow us to do this. And so here, I think there's been a big emphasis on developing astronauts who can move into space. I think this is really the big challenge, is moving into the space between your ears as the new frontier. It's very similar to a Star Trek movie, for instance, going out to seeing new planets. Um, so the connections uh, are complex, but they're intriguing. And we have technologies like this one, Clarity, which takes the lipid out of the brain, makes it translucent. So if you have stained, this, in this case, the neuron with a particular fluorescent dye, you can see all the connections that those neurons are making. These are not all the neurons. These are sparsely labeled cells, but gives you an example of a technique that allows you to get a 3D connections in the brain. And we'll get back to this with some further technology that's advanced this even further. I should say we're not the only agency going after the brain initiative. The National Science Foundation, DARPA, and the FDA, and IARPA have been also strong partners along with multiple private groups, the Kavli Foundation, the Allen Institute, the Simons Foundation, and IEEE. Now, to explain the brain initiative, we have basically separated out, we meaning the, the science community and NIH taking their their call from them into seven high priority areas. The first one is, is the cell census, trying to understand all the different cell types in the brain, we call discovering diversity. The second one is developing the maps at multiple scales, so the nanometer scale, where basically proteins are interacting with receptors, the scale of synapses interacting the pre and the postsynaptic junction nerve cells and a nucleus interacting together, and then nerve cells with, um, with nuclei all over the brain distributed interacting with themselves. So the spatial resolution is really tremendous. There's also a, a spatial scale. There's also a developmental scale that's also incredible, that you start out in an early developmental stage, and this, this amazing computer is, is basically manufactured every time a new person is born, and that those scales over time are tremendous. And then the, the brain circuits are plastic, so they're changing all the time. And so when we learn something, we learn, we went to school, we don't know math, we come out of school, we know math, a circuit in the brain changed to allow us to do that. So experience is also changing the brain, so the experience is an, another area of complexity. And to understand this, we'd like to see the brain in action. We'd like to see activity going on when we think, when we talk, um, and, and this now is possible. We have technology that has come through that I'll show you that allow us to actually record neural activity from thousands, if not a million neurons at a time in an animal as the animal is performing a particular task. That's something that we could not do before the brain initiative. We can also manipulate the circuits in a way in which we could never do before. Um, some of these use electrical techniques. Some of them use optical steering techniques to turn on or turn off certain cells in an image up to 20 at a time to manipulate a circuit. The idea being if you can manipulate a circuit, if you have a model of what the circuit's doing, you manipulate it, you should be able to predict the change in behavior if you think that that network activity was the driving cause of the behavior. And now I should say that the cell census project is, is essential to these two main components. Because the cell census doesn't just give you a list of different cell types, but the cell census project got off to a tremendous start when there was an explosion in the ability to do single cell transcriptomics. So when now we, are, we have a program going on now to get all the different cell types in the mouse brain, 8.5 billion cells, divide, determine all the different cell types and with each of these transcriptomic cell uh, signatures, you get cell type specific enhancers or promoters that you can then hook up to the, your gene of interest, put it into a mouse, either transgenic or with uh, a virus, and you can now specifically turn on or turn off these cell types in a precise manner. The best example, the one that is hitting my brain the most, is an ex uh, experiment out of Stanford where they found a cell group in the amygdala where if they turned the cells off, the animals responded to pain normally in terms of moving away from the pain, but they didn't seem to care. 
There was no kind of negative emotion to the pain. So when you think about trying to develop a treatment for people who are suffering with chronic pain, it's exactly what you would want. You don't want to take all the pain away because they'll bump their head, they'll burn their tongue, but you'd like to take away that suffering that's associated with the pain. And that, this experiment, you know, it's, it's not, you know, it's not nailed in stone, but it gets you to the point that maybe there are cells that you can do that to if you just figure out where they are. And in this experiment, they did think they figured it out. They turn them off, and they get this incredible behavioral response. And that gets you the idea of causality. It's not just looking at network activity and correlating the behavior, but it's actually intervening and changing behavior. Um, but with all that, what we, the, as I mentioned in the beginning, the idea is that with this type of data, we'll understand the language of the brain, these th fundamental principles that are, require people really skilled in theory, mathematics, um, to uh, put these principles out in front for testing. And of course, we're all, the purpose at NIH is not just for discovery for the sake of discovery, but discovery for the sake of patients. So moving this into human neuroscience, and understanding how all these brain circuits allow us to do what we, we can do. Now, I wanted to just stop there and say we have made lots of progress, and I'll show you some, but we have a lot of big problems still out there. So we can record from neurons, uh, but we're limited to the coverage area of the brain that we can do. So figuring out how to get better coverage of brain, if you can only look at one tiny region, you're going to be limited in what you can do. Optical techniques have exploded. The challenge, though, is that they're great for things on the surface of the brain, but because of the light scattering, getting deeper than a millimeter into the brain seems daunting, if not impossible. And that is clearly a huge challenge. So other ways of getting signals out of the brain uh, that get around this problem of light scattering would be incredibly important. The computational theory challenge I mentioned, and then a lot of the work has been done in mouse, uh, for us to make this available, you know, to understand movement into humans, we really need to go into larger brains at some stage. So the scaling is, is incredibly uh, challenging on how to do this. Um, okay. Now, this is a school that prides itself on its engineering, and I would say that we also are desperate for engineers to enter the brain initiative, and we have a number of them out here that I'll mention. Um, but this just gives an example. At the Brain Initiative meeting, which is held every year, there were more engineers than there were any other group. Uh, they were all interested in neuroscience, but it was uh, highly, highly uh, populated by engineers. Um, now, the outcomes were, so as I mentioned, the Mouse Brain Project is off and running, and we're hoping to get what we call a Google map of the brain of the mouse with all the different cell types, where they're located, where they're connected to. But that's kind of like a scaffold based on the transcriptomics and the location. We need to fill that scaffold in with the morphology, the intricacies of the different connections, the physiology, the different type of cells, their molecular makeup, the proteomics, for instance. And so we're just starting this project. Um, but we think we can build a scaffold for an entire mouse brain. The big question in front of us is can we do something like that for the human brain within the time frame of the brain initiative? And that is our plan. So this is seen, uh, you know, how we, are, what our aspirations are is to put considerable effort into the mouse brain and then start the human brain project uh, with that type of knowledge and then keep that going even past the 2026 mark. Now, this one is a movie and I think you guys have to hit this one, yeah. So this is just you know, a tiny speck of brain. I think it's less than a millimeter, if I remember right. And it's basically a serial electron microscopy through this tiny section. And it's uh, then been uh, serial stitched together. So all the connections between the different EM sections were stitched together to just indicate the kind of complexity. And again, this is a tiny speck of brain. What you'd like to do is to have this for an entire brain. And that is a challenge that people are thinking about, particularly on the mouse side. It's been done in the Drosophila brain. Um, but, but I just wanted to show it to you to, to give you a sense of what the complexity is at the spatial scale. So that's not even connecting it to all different other parts of the brain. One 
progress that's been made in this area, which is ingenious, uh, there we go, is um, uh, Ed Boyden at the MIT, uh, who developed, along with Carl Deseroff, this clarity technique. Uh, you take the lipid out of the brain, but then he replaced it with a polymer, and this polymer expands in water but doesn't distort the structure of the brain. So basically, you start with a small brain, and you, when you put the polymer in, put in water, the brain expands to nine times the original size without losing its, its structure. And what that allows you to do is to actually you can use a fluorescent marker on one side of the synapse versus the other side, which you would need an electron microscope to resolve. But now, when, it, when it's pulled apart with the expansion microscopy, you can do this with light microscopy. So he um, teamed up with Eric Betzig at Genelia, who won the Nobel Prize for super resolution microscopy techniques. And they have this technique now that you can do the entire Drosophila brain or well, the entire mouse cortex in two days. The electron microscopy of the Drosophila brain takes many, many months to do by electron microscopy. Now, this offers the opportunity to do something like this in human brain. Um, I should also say that one fallout of the cell census project was that a lot of the information that was coming from the transcriptome and the cytoplasm that we used to, to classify different cell types that same information is in the nucleus, in the RNA in the nucleus. So you can actually do a very good classification of cell types based on nuclear RNA or actually the chromatin pattern in the nucleus. Why I mention that is because you can't dissociate the cytoplasm in human brain tissue, but you can dissociate the nuclei in human brain tissue. And so we actually have the ability to do the cell census project in human autopsy tissue using the nucleus as opposed to the cytoplasm. So this is just an example of the ability to measure neural activity uh, during, in an awake behaving mouse. And so this is using optical techniques where the gene um, is put into the, the mouse so that when calcium flows into the cell, the cell lights up. So instead of sticking electrodes and recording from one or two neurons at a time, now you can see thousands of neurons at a time in a awake behaving animal, collect the data, and try and develop the correlation of what the network activity, how it is generating the behavior. Okay. I seem to be stuck. There we go. Um, and people here at Purdue have been very much engaged. This is Meng uh, Sui's work, uh, developing a new imaging technique that expands the field of view so we can see more of the surface of the brain in, in terms of recording from cells. And another paper from their lab actually trying to get us to be able to look deeper into the brain tissue using uh, adaptive optics and a, uh, an ultrasound-driven uh, um, scanning system. So the problems that we're facing are really engineering problems. And and the, uh, the barriers are the physical structures of, the, of brain tissue. And so the folks who can solve these problems are really the folks in this room and the folks at Purdue. And they have been. There are also um, technologies now um, to develop sensors, so not just when the calcium flows in, but when dopamine binds to a cell. There are artificial genes that have been put in that the cell lights up. And people here at Purdue this is Matt Tantamer, if I got it right, pronounce it right. Matt Tantamer's lab developed an ATP sensor, so when ATP is released from cells, binds to the cell surface, the cell lights up around the surface. So we have now optical sensors, very high temporal um, uh, resolution, to actually see chemical events going on in the brain as well as the electrical events. Now how this is gonna get into people we can turn on or turn off cells with light. Um, there are people who have developed uh, nanoparticles injected into the brain that will turn on or turn off adjacent cells when there's electric magnetic radiation from the surface of the brain or focused ultrasound from the surface of the brain. Um, but tried and true way is to give somebody a medicine. And so this technology called DREAD technology puts in artificial genes that are totally inactive until 
a chemical is given to the person or the animal in this instance, that chemical binds to the, to the artificial receptor and that turns on or turns off the cell. So this would give us the ability, and I think this will go into people first. The reason is because if you have a problem, you just don't give them the chemical anymore. So it's, it's controlled manipulation of the cell type. But you can do this in, in an animal now. You can pick, and, and actually the example I told you before about those pain neurons being turned off, that was done with this technology. So they give the animal the chemical, and that turned off the cells, and then the animal was no longer bothered by a painful stimulus. We are doing work in the human, although most of the work has been done in the animals, uh, but people, particularly in the neurosurgical space, have the ability to record from human brain, and this is people who have um, uh, epilepsy and come in for epilepsy monitoring. You need to find out where the epilepsy activity is coming from, but you can also recruit these patients into trials, and this the trial- The that you are seeing is available in moves. It's recording over the, the speech area. The proof that you are seeking is not available in books. That sends signals to the larynx the and pharynx. The proof that you are seeking is available in books. So what they've been able to do is actually decode what someone is saying from the neural activity they record over the brain. And um, this would en potentially enable someone who has ALS to actually talk through a computer because they can activate their motor cortex, but they can't activate the muscles. And this takes the activity from the motor cortex directly and creates sound. Another example. Dr. Nader Paradian implanted the device made by Second Sight over the visual cortex in Jason's brain. The Orion device converts images from a tiny video camera on a pair of sunglasses into a series of electrical pulses. Those pulses stimulate electrodes in Jason's brain that let him see patterns of light that act as visual cues. We uh, basically have the video camera and the video processing unit functioning or performing the functions of what the eye normally does and we go directly back to the brain. So in this case, the patient is not seeing images, he's seeing just dots of light. Um, and you would think, well, that's not too useful, but you know, he's trying to crossing the street and if there's a car coming, the dots of light start coming up and he knows there's a car coming. And the funny thing he said was, when his wife's mad at him, she doesn't say anything, so he doesn't know where she is, but now he can find her. Uh, so, so there are, it's amazing when people have these disabilities how a little bit of technology makes a huge amount of difference. So I'm gonna end by just saying that the technologies I talked to you about have tremendous potential to improve health. I think you've got a couple of examples of that. Um, but you can easily imagine how these technologies could be used for other purposes. And so in the Brain Initiative, right from the beginning, we've been very cognizant of the ethical issues that are inherent to the ability to record electrical activity in someone's brain or manipulate activity in someone's brain. And so we have had a group that's been advising us all along. They develop general guidelines for our investigators. We have groups in our program that talk to the investigators about these ethical issues should they come up. And we feel very confident that we can manage these in the health space. Um, how they're used in someone who's blind or someone who can't talk. There are issues, but they seem solvable. For a greater society, we are not so secure that these technologies will be used in the appropriate manner. And we're not sure that anybody knows what the appropriate manner to use these technologies really is. Um, one can start and say, well, why would you manipulate someone's brain? Well, we do it every day. Um, the best example is the school. You were in a university. People come here to have their brains changed. They learn you know, differential equations. They didn't have circuits to do differential equations when they came, but they do when they leave if they're in math. Um, that's a circuit. How, how you learn is gonna be how you change a circuit. We don't know how you do that. We will know how you do that. Um, and then the question is, are there technologies that should be applied to the brain to enable better education? Just an example. More threatening, potentially, are technologies that are put in military people so that they can you know, much more efficiently drive a fighter jet. They don't have to use their hands 
activity goes right from the brain right to the, right to the jet. Um, lots of other science fiction type things one can think about. Um, and there, society is really going to have to have a really strong, considered discussion about where these things should go. And that's something I th I'm happy to talk to you about. I don't have the answers, but I hope people will be cognizant of this as you go forward. Um, so with that, I'd like, just like to say, if people go to the Society for Neuroscience meeting, uh, we have a couple of things regarding to the Brain Initiative. Um, one is a seminar on about six different technologies um, that have been produced and available for others to use. And uh, then we have a, a, a tools and technology more informal session at a social um, hosted by the Cavalry Foundation on Sunday. Uh, so hopefully we'll see you there. So thanks very much and appreciate your attention. Yeah. So Dr. Korshitz and I are going to have a, a very brief dialogue. I will remind you that in a bit we'll invite you audience members, if you have questions, uh, to ask those questions of Dr. Korshitz. And there are microphones here in the front. We'll invite you front, front and center. Um, I do want to start out, you mentioned engineers and physicists, and obviously Purdue is a place that's uh, well known for engineering as well as the other sciences that are here. But if you could pick just one or two things that are of highest priority for engineers and biomedical scientists to work together on that would impact the brain initiative, what would those one or two things be? Well, I'd say, uh, first of all, which, you know, in, in advising particularly young people, I'd say what you want to do is to look at a field and find out what you're passionate about and go for that. So don't let anybody tell you what to do. <laughs> that being said, I think what you should do is, no. uh, that being said, you know, the things I mentioned, um, our biggest problem, I think, that I don't, we don't know if there is a solution is how to get information from deeper in the brain out of the brain. And so uh, on two aspects, even in the animal models, going deep into the brain is a big problem. But if we want to translate to humans, we need to develop ways of getting these kind of signals you know, non-invasively out of the brain through the skull. So, develop, so that, I think, is the biggest problem, is depth. And particularly when you get to bigger brains, it gets to be a tremendous problem. So that would be the thing I hope people could focus on. As we think about decoding the brain, and, and you showed the, the slide of, of the epilepsy patient where right. we're decoding circuits, and, and you think about taking new technologies that further and further refine our ability to decode brain circuits and correlate that with individuals' thoughts, you really start to talk about the science fiction realm of almost reading minds. And suddenly now, you, and you mentioned some of the ethics of this, but right. let's talk a little bit about what, what the, the ethical implications are as we begin to map and decode these brain circuits. How as a society can we prepare for that? Well, I think that's, that's kind of the big question I tried to end on. I think uh, what we do, which is we have this luxury of being in this medical space, so we can say, you know, you know, this is what you can do with the data, and that's all you can do. And that's got to be in the consent form, and the patient has to know about it. Uh, so, um, and, and also, the patient has to know what that data is being used for. So in the epilepsy monitoring unit, people have these electrodes on the surface of their skull for weeks at a time. So there's lots of things that are happening to them in that time period that they may not want somebody to decode. And so that is something that the investigators have an agreement with the patient. Now, as I mentioned, the thing that I'm more concerned about is if these technologies get out into, um, into space where, for instance, they're used for you know, driving a car. Um, how do we know that the, the company that put this in is not also you know, knowing what else you're thinking? Besides, you know, maybe a left turn or a right turn. And that's where I think those kind of things we haven't had to face before, but those are coming. And I think society is going to have to put, you know, establish the rules of the game in, that, in those spaces. And, and those, I don't, think, I don't think there's any real good precedence there. You wouldn't be suggesting that there's companies out there spying on us, would you? <laughs> As our iPhones are listening. Yeah, yeah. well, we've heard that. <laughs> but, but then they only hear what we say and not what we think. 
Exactly. Yeah. So as we think about uh, brain disorders, and, and, and there's uh, certainly numerous brain disorders that are uh, still very much seeking treatments. Right. Oftentimes in my world of pharmacy, we think about uh, medications, right. but there are clear examples where there are devices and technologies that are coming forward that can have a major impact. Right. And so maybe in addition to maybe a few of the things that you showed, what other kinds of devices or technologies are out there that you've seen on the forefront that would be available to treat brain disorders? Right, so, uh, so I think the most powerful one to fall out of the brain initiative is gonna be the ability to introduce genes that allow you to turn on or turn off particular neuron mm -hmm. types. And so if you think about Parkinson's disease, you wanna turn on the dopamine neurons. That's totally doable now in an animal. Um, but uh, if we could find the circuits for manic depressive switching or um, pain emotion, um, I think that, that still I think that the first step is going to be this design, this combination between the gene and the neuron, specific neuron type, and a drug that then interacts with that, that particular artificial receptor. And so developing those chemicals, I mean, the chemical that's used now in animals is clozapine which you don't want to use in people, it's an antipsychotic. Um, so we need better, better um, medicinal chemistry for this new age mm. of uh, gene-directed uh, cell-specific therapy. You have a chance in your job to sort of see, again, things that are on the forefront. What's the boldest or biggest idea that you've heard of anyone that, that's out there uh, you know, we, the, tw the science fiction of 20 years ago is, is, is the reality of today, and I'm right. thinking, what's 20 or 30 years down the road? Well, uh, and, and you've heard people dream about what they'd love to see, be able to do, scientists around the country, yeah. and you would probably right now say, there's no way that's possible, but what, what maybe what's wrong? Right. Well, that actually happened already. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing that I thought was impossible, which happened, was um, Nanad Sestan at Yale, um, figured out a way to reperfuse the brain uh, in pigs four hours after it was decapitated. Now that's supposed to be impossible, but he did it. And not only did he do that, but he showed that metabolism returned into the brain, and he showed that in slices of the brain taken, you know, 24 hours later, there was activity. Mm -hmm. So that is, you know, that for us was a major ethical cha challenge to deal with. And, um, uh, but on the other hand, it allows us to actually do some of these technologies to map the human brain that we could never do before. So it preserves the tissue. It could, if we did this in a human, in an ethical manner, it would preserve the tissue so we could actually get the connections uh, which you can't do once the tissue is no longer, you know, sending proteins here and there. Um, to do the, say, the connectomics, for instance. Mm. So th I think that that was, if you, I mean, the answer to the question is, no one thought that was possible. It already happened. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, as a university, and this is actually going to be my last question, so if you do have a question for uh, Dr. Koroshetz, uh, we'll invite you up in just a moment. Um, but as a university, uh, how should we be thinking about educating and training and to prepare that next generation of neuroscientists, clinicians, and basic scientists in the brain-related disciplines. Right. So, so I think um, I think the strength here is the weakness at many other places. <laughs> so I always play your strengths. Right. You know, uh, you better go and right and shooting right, go right um, if you get a chance. So uh, I would say that. Um, you know, the computational, the engineering, the material science folks, uh, particularly in the brain initiative, are really the people who, are, who really bring you to the next level. And that involves, you know, it can't, it's not going to happen automatically. It involves, you know, a real kind of scientific discussion between the neuroscientists in the, in the brain space and, and the people in the physical or engineering sciences. And, uh, but... The, the great lesson for me in the Brain Initiative was that NIH was not investing in technology sufficiently, and the Brain Initiative opened the doors to folks from these different areas. So what is a neuroscientist? You can train, uh, there are so many ways you can train to 
to be able to contribute to neuroscience and diversity is what we need as opposed to you know someone who's in you know a singular track so i think that you're doing what you're i think you're doing the right thing here and just to build those opportunities for folks to to get engaged in the neuroscience problems i think would be great great well we do want to open uh, the floor up for questions from the audience i would invite you to please come to the microphones in the front and if you would, uh, if, uh, introduce yourself. If you're a, a student, tell us uh, what discipline you're from. If you're a faculty member, perhaps what department you're from, so that we have a sense of who's asking questions. But at this time, we'll invite uh, you to ask questions of Dr. Korshitz. Right. And if you don't ask questions, I'll ask you questions. <laughs> Here we go. Hello, Dr. Korshitz. Hi. Uh, uh, thank you for your talk today. I thought it was very interesting. This is something that I'm cu very curious about. Uh, I just wanted to ask you if you believe that this work or this research done at the NIH and with the Brain Initiative will lead to a better understanding about consciousness um, within the human brain. Well, that's a really interesting question. <laughs> so I would say, let me correct you, the, uh, the work is not being done at NIH. It's where funding is being done all over the country. <laughs> okay, yeah. But uh, so... So it's interesting you brought this up because there's a big battle between the two advisory groups that we had. The neuroethics group said that, we, that a moonshot project is we should try and understand the neural circuitry under consciousness. And the hardcore scientists said, we're not ready to do that. <laughs> so I don't know the answer to the question. Uh, but then I would say, so I'm a neurologist. And, and if one thinks about you know, simplified issues, the big problem for us was we would have people who would have head injury and they would be in coma, so they have no consciousness. And we had no good way of telling the family whether that person was going to return to consciousness. And some people did, and it would take sometimes six months to a year. Some people didn't. Uh, so it offers the opportunity, and people are taking this, to try and study those patients, to try and see what brain circuits are are destroyed in people who never return to consciousness. And also, what brain circuits start to come online over time as someone does return to consciousness? And so if you think of consciousness as, some, as something at that level, you know, you either have it or you don't, then I think it's something we can, we can approach and then potentially give it insights into the neural circuits that are involved in the bigger consciousness issue. Uh, but that's, that's how I see it at this point. Okay, thank you. I should probably introduce myself. I'm Chris. I'm, uh, hey, Chris. I'm in chemical engineering and biochemistry. Um, I'm an undergrad student. I'm a senior. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hello. I'm Muriel. I'm from medicinal chemistry and molecular pharmacology. I'm a third year PhD. And I had a question more about animal usage. Do you ever see the way the directions are going decreasing the use of animal models and more towards organoids and human-based models like stem cells. Very good. So we, um, there, has, there has been tremendous advances in the use of induced pluripotent stem cells in the nervous system. Um, and, um, and so the lot of activity now has shifted from searching for targets in animal models and moved towards human cells. Uh, particularly because in many of the animal models, the targets didn't actually help us get to treatments. And so particu particularly the industry, the drug industry is very interested in this as well. So a lot of work has shifted to iPS cells. In terms of organoids, um, again, these are, again, iPS cells that are then, or they're, they're yeah, induced polyprotein sin cells that are then allowed to grow divide and organize themselves. And it's really quite remarkable in the early stages how this actually happens. And it seems to recapit recapitulate development uh, very faithfully. Um, and so I think it's a great model to understand de brain development. Um, now, if you get to questions like, you know, how do animals communicate, um, then I it's hard to imagine that we can answer or even get close to answers in those questions without animal experimentation. And in actual fact, I think that in many of the issues that we've been struggling with in diseases, 
Um, part of the problem is that the mouse is, is so different from the human that it's led us down um, the wrong pathway. So we actually have to think about moving back out of the mouse into larger, uh, maybe non-human primates as well for the disease work, and for these complicated circuits that don't exist in the mouse, which doesn't have much say in the way of frontal cor prefrontal cortex, we really will have to move even into non-human primates to be able to, dis to analyze those circuits. So it's a little bit of both. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions for Dr. Korshitz? Well, I'll ask one last question. Okay. Uh, probably on the minds of many are uh, treatments or even cures for two of our diseases of aging. And it falls somewhat in the NINDS mission and it falls a little bit out, but certainly Parkinson's and dementia are right. two conditions that I know are on the forefront of many in our society's minds. And kind of tell us where you think we are in terms of treatments and, and cures from what you see from where you sit. Okay, well, um, so the, the neurodegenerative diseases, um, they're, as, as, you, as you hinted, they're real tragedies for folks and their families. And so the question is, is there you know, a straight line path where we think we can really make a big difference? And so again, you know, as I said in the beginning, we know a little bit and then we know there's a lot we don't know. You know, the question is, can we use what little we know to make a difference? Most of the money now is on this idea that each of these neurodegenerative diseases is associated with aggregates of protein inside the cells, and it's tau in Alzheimer's, tau in progressive supernuclear palsy, and some of the frontal dementias, and synuclein in Lewy body disease, Parkinson, multiple system atrophy. And so can we, if we figured a way to prevent these aggregates from occurring, would that basically stop the disease from progressing? And we also know that these aggregates are spreading from one nerve cell to the other. So can we prevent the spread? Because each of these diseases start locally and then they spread through different brain areas. So if we can prevent the spread of these aggregates, will that kind of stop the disease in its tracks? So that's where most of the money is right now. But again, it's a lot of this is what we know, so this looks good, but until you, know, until you try it and you fail, you, there's a lot you don't know. So I think one big example has been the clearance of amyloid from people who have Alzheimer's disease has so far been successful in clearing amyloid, but it has not had any clinical effect on patients. So that was clearly a lot of people Surprise, surprise a lot of people. Um, and there may be explanations for that, but it's just an example of when you, you think you know exactly what the problem is, nature sometimes just hits you right in the face and says, you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. And that is probably a good place for us to stop. Yeah, that's the, a the brain challenge is, for the future. Yeah, the brain is cer certainly a, a, still a lot to, to discover. <laughs> Uh, as you said, it's sort of where no one has gone before, so to speak, uh, and we look forward to the discoveries uh, that continue to occur here at places like Purdue, and, and, and we appreciate uh, the continued support from the National Institutes of Health. Would you please join me in thanking Dr. Korshitz for spending the evening with us? Thank you. Thank you. We do have a small thank you. Thank oh, you, Gift. So uh, there's something to remember Purdue by. Black and gold. Uh, so it is, will be <laughs> black and gold uh, back in, in Bethesda. So, Great. And thank you all for being with us this evening. Uh, enjoy your evening. See you. Good. That was fun.